Well, last uh, week we looked at verses 1 to 3 and Jesus is uh, speaking about himself as the true vine. And uh, possibly the disciples with the Lord are on their way through the gar- to the Garden of Gethsemane. And uh, possibly, although we don't know for definite, maybe the Lord sees uh, a vineyard and draws attention to that and describes himself as the true vine. And um, now this evening we want to move down to verse 4. And uh, there, there's um, a command that Jesus gives. Although some have suggested that maybe uh, the words abide in me um, are are not just a command, but a promise. So what Jesus is going to do for his disciples, for all true believers, is to ensure that they abide in him, that his life is part of them. And so it's a wonderful uh, theme that we have in these verses. So this evening we're looking at uh, John 15 verses 4 to 8. And uh, I wonder if you've, um, you've probably been to garden centres and you've seen, you may have seen those little plaques that you can buy. Uh, it's got those humorous little words on it. Um, something like, on this spot in 1973, nothing happened. And uh, so you can buy one of those, put it in your garden, and uh, it's meant to, to maybe this stir the gardener in you to action and make sure that, noth- uh, that things do happen in your garden. The the Lord Jesus doesn't want nothing to happen in the lives of his people, does he? Uh, He wants us to bear fruit for him. And uh, we'll we'll touch on that uh, in in a few moments. Uh, But first of all, we we just want to uh, focus on the command that Jesus gives. uh, Abide in me. And if you notice in the reading uh, from verse 4 down to verse 8, Jesus uses that word abide seven times. And if Jesus uh, repeats a word... Uh, then he's obviously emphasizing something important, isn't he? Uh, He's telling his disciples uh, to stay with him. The word abide means to dwell or to live, uh, to settle down. Uh, In this context, uh, we think of a little branch uh, joined to the vine, and the life, the sap of the vine, is flowing into the branches. And uh, Jesus has already said, if we don't belong to him, then loose attachment is not enough. We think of Judas Iscariot, uh, who had an attachment to Jesus, but he wasn't saved, he wasn't truly born again. And so he's removed. Jesus is now left with his true disciples. And he urges his disciples to stay with him and uh, to realize their need of him. And so first of all, in verses 4 uh, down to verse uh, 8, Uh, We just want to notice that word abide, mentioned seven times by the Lord Jesus. Uh, Settle down with me, Jesus says. Stay with me, abide with me. You remember the the two men on the road to Emmaus, uh, when the Lord Jesus appeared to them after his resurrection. And they didn't realize it was the Lord Jesus. Uh, But uh, something of the words of Christ uh, was burning in their hearts. And then they they made a request, uh, as Jesus would have gone further, in Luke chapter 24, And verse 29, they they simply said to Jesus, abide with us. They wanted Jesus to stay with them, them. although at that point they didn't realize who it was. But but they they wanted his presence to stay with them. Maybe you know the words of an old hymn uh, with this prayer in it. O Jesus, ever with us stay. Make all our moments calm and bright. Chase the dark night of sin away, shed o'er our souls thy holy light and so first of all we can think about the priority of the christian life Uh, i wonder as a christian this evening what is your priority in the christian life Uh, we could take the words of the lord jesus here and say that this this ought to be our priority really to abide in christ to remain with him there are many enemies against us we know satan is powerful he would seek to pull us away from christ if he could Uh, The world is against us. We have sin that remains in our bodies. uh, And uh, all these things pull against us. But Jesus says, abide in me. Not not just with me, but in me. It's this wonderful theme of union with Christ. To be a Christian means uh, not just that we attend a church building uh, with other people, although that can be very helpful. But to be a Christian surely means to be joined to Christ. Uh, And as we said last time, loose attachment is not enough. Many people think that to be religious is enough. 
or to be christened or baptized or to do communion. Maybe those things they think is enough. But uh, in our reading of the New Testament, we see that Jesus tells us that we have to belong to him. We have to be saved and know the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, once that happens, we, we are joined to Christ. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it? Maybe we don't think on it enough as we should, uh, as we should as Christians, to be joined uh, to the Lord Jesus. And so the, the priority of the Christian life, Jesus keeps on saying it to the disciples, abide in me. And uh, as, we, as we've read and as we've already said, seven times the Lord Jesus makes that statement. Uh, what does it mean to abide in Christ, to dwell with him, to live with him? Obviously, we're not talking about a literal, physical living because the body of the Lord Jesus is in glory, isn't it? It's not uh, any longer in, in, on the earth, but um, the resurrect, resurrected, glorified body of Christ has now been taken into the presence of his Father. So when Jesus says, live with me, abide with me, stay with me, we, we're not thinking about something literal or physical in that sense. Uh, but um, the scriptures help us to understand what it means. To abide in Christ means by faith. The Apostle Paul puts it like this in Ephesians and uh, in chapter 3. Uh, and he's praying for Christians. And the Apostle Paul says, uh, I, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. And then he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I, I'm praying that for you, the Apostle Paul says. They were already Christians, but he wanted them to, to know the, the, the presence of Christ with them daily. And he puts it like that, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So this abiding in Jesus is, is by faith, isn't it? It's not a visible thing, it's not a physical thing. Uh, but uh, by the Holy Spirit and uh, as he uh, helps us to believe on the Lord Jesus, we, we dwell with him by, by faith. We could also say, that as, as the New Testament helps us, that to abide in Christ means uh, by his word. Again, the Apostle Paul writes in Colossians chapter 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And uh, Jesus refers to that actually in this passage um, if my word abides in you, uh, Jesus speaks in, in, in that, in that uh, phrase, uh, my word abiding in you. And, and so when we think of Jesus abiding, uh, we abiding in him, he abiding in us, uh, it's by faith, but it's also by his word. Through the scriptures and the things that Christ has revealed about himself in the word of God, we, we ponder them, we meditate upon them. And they become precious to us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. It's not a passing thing, the word of Christ, but it, it lives within us. And then, of course, we could also say that to abide uh, in Christ is, is by the Holy Spirit. It's by the work of the Holy Spirit. So Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 says, Be filled, go on being filled by the Holy Spirit. And uh, the Holy Spirit, of course, is the Spirit of Christ, isn't he? Wherever the Holy Spirit is, the third person of the Trinity, he reveals and loves to reveal more of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're jumping a little bit in verse 10 in John 15, and, and Jesus also says that to abide in him means to keep his commandments, obedience. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So when Jesus says to us, abide in me and I in you, it's by faith, it's by the word of God, it's by the work and help of the Holy Spirit. And it's also by obedience as we live and uh, submit ourselves to the, the word and, uh, and the commands that Christ has given to us. So uh, the priority of the Christian life what is your priority as a Christian this evening? Is it to abide and to be close to the Lord Jesus? Is that your greatest desire? Uh, Matthew Henry, who wrote that great Bible commentary, uh, makes this statement in one of his books. 
on communion with God. Uh, Henry says, if we are weak in communion with God, then we are weak everywhere. That's true, isn't it? If we are weak in communion with God, we are weak everywhere. Jesus doesn't want his disciples to be weak and feeble, to be ineffective. And so he says to them, abide in me and I in you. You live in me, Jesus says, and I live in you. Think of the words of the Apostle Paul in Galatians 2 verse 20 where he says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Is, is there a more wonderful statement of the Christian life than that? What, what does it mean to be a Christian? Jesus Christ living in you. What an amazing thing. And you living in him. And so the Lord be begins like that in verse 4. Uh, Abide in me. And um, he repeats that a number of times. You think of Daniel in the Old Testament. Uh, Daniel who was, um, you could say, in lockdown all his life in Babylon for 70 years. Uh, and uh, he says, the people that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. Abiding in Christ, abiding in God. I remember reading some years ago about the, the, the Hebridean revival in the 1950s when Duncan Campbell was the preacher, the evangelist that God used to bring blessing there and many people were converted and revival came uh, at, at the islands there in Scotland. And um, maybe you know the story that as he stepped off the boat to go and hold one of the mission meetings, some Christians met him. And the first question they asked him as he got off the boat was, Mr. Campbell, are you walking with God? It's a powerful question, isn't it? That's all they wanted to know. Uh, not what are you bringing with you or not even what your sermon is. But are you walking with God? Isn't that the theme really of John 15? Jesus urging his disciples, his followers, settle down with me. Stay with me, abide in me. Let my life filter through, re receive the sap of the vine, as it were. And you are just a branch, Jesus says. I am the vine, you are just a branch. But let my life be in you, uh, abide in me. So the priority of the Christian life. Uh, uh, why is this important? Jesus gives us two reasons here in these verses. Uh, first of all, there's a word of realism. And um, if you see at the end of verse 4 there, uh, Jesus says, um, The branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. And uh, the Lord then repeats that truth in verse 5. Without me, you can do nothing. Twice Jesus says it. Do you think Christians would need to be told that um, without the Lord Jesus, they can do nothing. Why would we need to be told that? We shouldn't need to be told it, should we? And yet the Lord finds it necessary to tell them and to tell us as well in the pages of Scripture, in the Gospel year, that without him we can do nothing. I, I am the vine, the Lord says, you are the branches. And without my life coming to you, you can do nothing. William Williams of Pantakelling, the great um, hymn writer, uh, wrote these words in one of his hymns. So prone I am when on my own to stray from side to side. I need each step to paradise, my God to be my guide. Do you feel that yourself? So prone to stray from side to side. Every step of the way to paradise, to glory. I need God to be my guide. Can't do anything without him. And so dependence on God. Do you remember that story in the Old Testament, the book of Judges? Uh, Judges chapter 16, we are told about Samson. Um, that great story of, of um, the judge. And the Philistines capture him, remember? And they pull his eyes out and he's blind. Samson has lost his way really and he's compromised and... And uh, then you, you have that sad statement, you know, that he, he gets up just like other times. This is before he's captured, actually. Um, and uh, Samson did not know that the Lord had left him. 
didn't realise it. And then he's captured, his eyes are pulled out and he's blinded. And there he is put in the, uh, in the prison house. And the Philistines are making fun of him. They shave his head, which was a sign that he'd lost his way and he'd broken God's commands. But then we read this uh, tremendous verse in that chapter. The hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaven. And uh, one preacher put it like this. They, they could shave his hair, but they couldn't pull out the roots. His hair began to grow again. And sometimes as Christians, we, we lose our way, don't we? We, we? we backslide from the Lord. We, we, we might lose our way for a while. And, and it's as if our hair is shone. We've lost all our spiritual strength. But thank God, uh, the roots of grace go down deep. And we still belong to the Lord. And he can still restore us and we can still be useful to him. And uh, we know the end of the story that uh, Samson pushed the temple of the Philistines down. And, and he won a great victory, although it cost him his life. Joel chapter 2 verse 25 contains a similar promise. God says, I will restore to you the, the years that the locusts have eaten. And it's that reminder, you know, that Jesus gives to his disciples. Without me, you can do nothing. Dependence upon God. And, uh, and then there's a word of warning also, isn't there? We, we did touch on this last week, so I'll just mention it briefly now. But it, it is there again in verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and he's withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. It's not teaching that a Christian can lose their salvation, but surely Jesus is simply saying that if you're not really abiding in me, then that is an evidence that you weren't saved in the first place. And you're in danger of being cast away into the fire and being burned. So there's a word of warning there. Jesus warning his own disciples, if you like. And uh, do you remember when Jesus uh, was in the upper room with the disciples? And uh, he said to them, one of you will betray me. And uh, all of them at that point said, is it I? And Jesus didn't point Judas out at first. And he didn't, didn't tell all the other disciples, it's Judas. Jesus told them what was going to happen. And then he allowed them to examine themselves. Is it I? Am I the one? And we know it was Judas. He leaves the room and um, the Lord is left with his 11 disciples. But all of them asked, is it me? Why did Jesus do that? Why did he make them feel uncomfortable? Well, surely because sometimes it's good to ask ourselves that, isn't it? It's good to examine ourselves and, and to say, well, is it me? Am I genuine? Am I a real Christian? Or am I a Judas? Am I just attached to Christ without real saving faith, without the work of the Spirit in my heart? Am I a real believer? Am I abiding in Christ? Is his life in me? Is it I? So the priority of the Christian life. Uh, we could go on with that, couldn't we? Let me just um, mention two other things briefly. And um, the, next, uh, the second point is the possibilities of the Christian life uh, in verses 5 and verse 8 to you. The priority of the Christian life is to abide in Christ and to stay with him and to settle down with him, to know his life uh, within us. Secondly, the possibilities of the Christian life. What does Jesus say to his disciples? He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Can you see that Jesus repeats that in verse 8? By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Much fruit. What a challenge that is to Christians. The possibilities of the Christian life. Uh, remember a minister in, in um, revival meetings um, held by, uh, by the EMW ministers of meetings over the years revival meetings and there was one man and he's gone to glory now but he would begin his prayer um, sometimes with these words and the words have stuck in my mind lord he would say we thank thee for the possibilities 
that there are with thee. And he would begin his prayer like that, this godly man. The possibilities. It's a, it's a great little phrase, isn't it? Isn't that what Jesus is saying to his disciples? Do you realise the possibilities? Uh, much fruit. And you get a lot of this in the New Testament letters of the Apostle Paul and, and Peter uh, talking about Christians abounding in love and being filled with the Spirit. Not just muddling our way through and a little bit of blessing here and there, but much fruit. It's a challenge, isn't it? And um, Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, the Apostle Paul, just to give one example, he says, I pray this, that your love may abound more and more, and uh, that you may be filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. The fruits of righteousness, filled with them. What is, what is our attitude to be? Do we just say, well, you know, one day I'll, I'll be holy when I get to heaven? And so I'll wait till then. No, Jesus says to his disciples, abide in me, let, let my life flow into you and and you will produce much fruit filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ uh, notice also in these verses that Jesus teaches us that, are, that there are degrees of fruitfulness didn't Jesus say that in the parable of the sower uh, he talked about the, the fruitful heart and he said that some will give uh, fruit a hundredfold, another sixty and some thirty. So not everybody is the same. Uh, Christians, not all the same. What do we find Jesus saying here? Well, he says in, uh, in verse uh, 5, uh, he who bears much fruit without me, you can do nothing. And uh, he, he goes on to say that uh, my, my father uh, prunes uh, th th those who bear fruit so that they might bear more fruit he talks about fruit and then more fruit there are degrees of fruitfulness in the Christian life listen to these challenging words by Bishop J.C. Ryle he was the Bishop of Liverpool from 1880 to 1900 and on these verses Bishop J.C. Ryle says these words which are a challenge to all Christians I'm sure Here's the quote. There is a wide difference between believers and believers. In some things, they are all alike. All feel their sins and all trust in Christ. All repent and strive to be holy. All have faith and grace and new hearts. But they differ widely in the degree of their attainments. Some are far happier and holier than others and have far more influence on the world. That's what Ryle has to say on these verses. It's a challenge, isn't it, to Christians? You know, there's fruit, but then there's more fruit. Am I growing as a Christian? Am I abounding in love? Am I filled with the fruits of righteousness? How does it work out? Well, look at, the, look at what the Lord says there in, uh, in one of the verses. He speaks about prayer. He talks about a fruitful prayer life. Verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. And so the, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, stimulating prayer. So how do I know if I'm abiding in Christ? And how do I know if, if the life of Christ is within me? Well, one simple question could be, what is your prayer life like? Because without prayer and dependence on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the life of Christ doesn't filter through to us, does it? And, and without a good and healthy prayer life, we will not produce much fruit. That's true as individual Christians. It's true in any church life. And so Jesus says, whatever you pray, it shall be done for you. The possibilities of the Christian life. Sometimes we attend meetings and um, sad to say, maybe shame, shame on us. Sometimes as Christians, we don't really expect much perhaps. 
Do you remember when you were first converted and maybe you went to the prayer meetings for the first time? And, uh, well, I, I can remember that, you know, you, you wanted to be there in such a way you were afraid to miss it in case you missed something. You expected something to happen. The possibilities. And, uh, well, it's a challenge, isn't it? Abide in me, Jesus says, and you will produce much fruit. Maybe you know the story of Corrie ten Boom. She was... Uh, from Holland and she became um, a watchmaker like her father and her family were arrested and all taken to Ravensbrück concentration camp. Her father and all her family died. Corrie ten Boom was released when she shouldn't have been in the providence of God. She went traveling the world afterwards giving her testimony and uh, the Lord blessed her, her life and her testimony, her Christian testimony. On one occasion she says she was talking to someone about answers to prayer. And the listener said to Corrie ten Boom, oh, that's just coincidence. And uh, Corrie ten Boom replied, well, she said, it's strange. It's a strange thing. When I pray, coincidences happen. And when I don't pray, they don't happen. Well, she was right, wasn't she? Prayer. Seeking the face of God. Dependence upon God. I am the vine, Jesus says. The risen Lord Jesus Christ. We are just little branches. Joined to Christ. But wonderfully his life. Comes into us. And as we depend on him and pray to him. And realise our need of him. We can be filled with the fruits of righteousness. Some people have asked well what is the fruit dear? Is it conversions? Is it a holy life? Perhaps we can bring all those things together. The witness of a Christian, a healthy testimony, a godly life. All these things we could say uh, make up the fruit, don't they? Paul's words in Galatians 5. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy and peace, meekness and long-suffering. The fruit of the Spirit, a godly life. And so when people come into contact with us, they... They, they maybe not real, without realizing it, but they know there's something different about us. Jesus' life is in us. And so the, the priority of the Christian life is to abide in Christ and the possibilities of the Christian life, much fruit. Let's briefly look at one other thing from this uh, little passage, the purpose of the Christian life. Uh, what, what's the purpose of the Christian life? Where, where, where does Jesus go to? Uh, notice the end of verse 8, or, or, the, or the whole part of verse 8, really. Jesus says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. And, and there's two things there that Jesus uh, finishes this little section with. He goes on to talk more about abiding and explaining what it means. But in verse 8, he, he sort of focuses on two things. Uh, first of all, he says, that this, this will bring glory to my Father. By this, my Father is glorified. The purpose of the Christian life is to bring glory to God. It's not just that we might have nice feelings or feel good about ourselves, but that the Father might be glorified. Uh, in the, in the um, diaries of Thomas Charles of Bala, um, he writes um, a little sentence. This is what it says. Thomas Charles, in, in one of his uh, diary, diary for the day, uh, he says, Let us have a regard for God's glory as well as our own safety. He was thinking about salvation, thinking about the glory of God. And yes, our own safety is involved in that, isn't it? Jesus saves us. But Thomas Charles says to Christians, let's have a regard for the glory of God as well as our own safety. That should be our concern, shouldn't it? To glorify God. Why is Jesus going to the cross? At the end of chapter 14 of John, verse 31, Jesus says that the world may know that I love the Father and as the Father has given me a commandment, even so I do. The Father's given me a command. 
and I'm going to the cross. The obedience of Christ and, and everything that Jesus does uh, is, is not for himself, but to glorify his Father. And now he, he involves his people in that. Tells us to abide in him, go on believing in him, praying to him, being dependent on him, trusting in him. The, the risen life of Christ is to be in us so that we bear much fruit. But, but even that is, is not for ourselves. My Father is glorified in this, Jesus says. And uh, that, that's um, a great thing, isn't it? You find this in Romans 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 29. The Apostle Paul says, The end of salvation is that no flesh should glory in his presence. That's the end of salvation. That everybody takes their place in humility, before the great God. Did, didn't we sing about that in the hymn just now? Hail Abraham's God and mine. And Father, Son and Holy Ghost. And, and the, the triune God receives all the praise. 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 11. If anyone ministers, Peter says, let him do it with, uh, as of the ability that God gives. That, that God may be glorified in all things. Is that your greatest desire? In the footsteps of your Saviour. Just as Jesus wanted to glorify his Father, so you want to glorify God too. And then finally, notice the, the other thing the Lord says at the end of verse 8, regarding the purpose of the Christian life. Not just to glorify uh, God in heaven, God the Father, but then Jesus says, so you will be my disciples. And uh, in, in the chapel Bible here that you use, the ESV, uh, it's got the word proven. You will, you will be proven to be disciples. So Jesus isn't telling us, if you do this, this, and this, you will become a Christian. That would be wrong, wouldn't it? Because that would be saying salvation by works. We don't believe that as Christians. We, we don't say, well, do this, this, and this, and then you'll become a disciple. Surely what Jesus is saying at the end of verse 8 is, uh, as you abide in me, my grace has come to you, you've been saved, uh, and now you live with Christ, and the risen life of Christ is in you. You depend upon him. So it, it will become evident that you are a disciple. Isn't that what Jesus is saying? He's not teaching salvation by works. You shall be my disciples. It shall be noticeable that you are a disciple of Christ. Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, and uh, Jesus says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And so you, you will be known to be disciples of Christ. Many years ago, I, I hadn't been a Christian um, for very long, and I, I found in a Christian bookshop a little postcard, and there was a picture of a judge on it. And he was in a court of law, and the, the judge was there, you know, with his wig on. And uh, there was a caption at the bottom of the postcard. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? I've lost the postcard years ago, but the, the caption has always stayed with me. What evidence is there? Easy to say that I'm a Christian, isn't it? But Jesus says, this is, this is how it becomes evident that you are a disciple of mine. As you rely upon me and abide in me and my life is in you and you bear fruit, then it becomes evident. We finish this evening with the word disciples. That's the last word in verse 8. A Christian is a disciple. The word disciple means a follower. A follower of Jesus. A learner, if you like. A couple of years ago, there was um, um, a gas fitter. He was doing some work on our house, fit, uh, f uh, fixing our, our gas boiler. And um, I was making him a cup of tea, you know, and just chatting. And he, be, he was talking about other gas fitters. He, he'd been in the business for about 30 odd years. And uh, he said, you know, I, I'm always learning something new. You know, so some of these new ones, he said, they, they think they know it all. 
But I'm always learning, he said, prepare to learn. And afterwards I thought, you know, well, am I like that as a disciple of Christ? You come across people sometimes and they give the impression that they know it all. It's horrible to be like that, isn't it? Not willing to learn off anybody. And Jesus, talking to his disciples, uh, uh, speaks to them like that. You, You will be my disciples, sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning from him. Isn't that the best place to be? Learning from the Lord Jesus Christ, a a follower and listening to his voice like Mary sitting at his feet, hearing his word. So the the priority of the Christian life for each one of us must be if we follow Jesus, it, it is to abide in Christ and to stay with him. Essentially joined to him so that his life comes into us. The possibilities of the Christian life, much fruit. And the privilege of the Christian life, and, uh, and that is that we might be seen to be his disciples and uh, following the Lord Jesus. M- may God help us in his word and may he apply his word to us. May we uh, follow the Lord Jesus and be his disciples in these days.